family, I'm Jill Morricone. We're so glad you tuned in to 3ABN Sabbath School panel as you tune in from week to week and study with us of the Word of God. I can't believe we're in lesson number 13. We're all the way to the end of this quarter on the Great Controversy, and it's been an amazing study. Lesson 13 is called The Triumph of God's Love. I want to introduce to you my family, your family, with us on the panel. To my left, Professor Daniel Perrin. Glad you're here. Thank you. It's good to be here. I have Monday's lesson, which is Hope in Jesus' Soon Return. Amen. In the middle here, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Jill. I have Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled The Millennium on Earth. Oh, wonderful. Pastor Ryan Day. Amen. I have Wednesday's lesson entitled Judgment in the Millennium. Last but not least, at the other end, Pastor John Lomacain, my pastor. And mine is entitled The Two Eternities. The question is, which one? will you receive. Amen. Mm. It's going to be an amazing study. We want to go to the Lord in prayer, but first I want to remind you, if you want a copy of our notes, if you're already receiving them, you don't have to sign up again. But if you have not started receiving them, you can simply email us at ssp at 3abn.org. That stands for Sabbath School Panel, ssp at 3abn.org, and we would love to share with you our notes from week to week. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Pastor John, would you pray for us? Sure. Loving, gracious Father in heaven, we have spoken about the great controversy this entire quarter, and our lesson study is coming to an end. But Lord, we long for the day when the great controversy itself will be, uh, will come to an end. Yes. And so guide our minds and hearts as we disseminate the word. We pray that we'll be clearly led by your spirit and what is said today and what is studied and what is communicated will bring glory and honor to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This week we look at the triumph of God's love. And to me, this lesson is all about hope. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you a question. How do you maintain hope in the midst of darkness? I read a quote once I really like. It says, in a way, hope is not so much an emotion as it is a perspective. You know, we always say, we read the back of the book, and what does it say? Jesus wins. That's perspective. This world is not all there is. Jesus is coming again. And this world of sin and sickness will be over forever. Hope is how, in Romans 5, verses 3 and 4, we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. That word perseverance comes from two Greek words, one meaning remaining or endure and the other meaning under. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you and I remain under that trial or that tribulation. Mm -hmm. It is producing in us perseverance. We remain under and what does that remaining under or enduring through uh, bring about in our lives? It brings about character and character produces hope, eager expectation. It's perspective. The lesson says this, Revelation gives us hope for today, tomorrow, and forever. This week, we will discover that there actually can be hope in the time of trouble, that there's hope in Jesus' soon return. There's hope in the justice of Jesus' judgment. There's hope in the final eradication of sin and sinners. And there's hope in the recreation of the new heavens and the new earth. So let's read our memory text. And this gives me hope. We're in Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Doesn't that give you hope? God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. Doesn't that give you hope? There will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. If Shelly were here, she would say, hallelujah. <laughs> On Sunday, we'd hallelujah. look at hope. Hallelujah. That's right. <laughs> That's for you, Shelly. On Sunday, we look at hope in the time of trouble. And I'm going to talk about seven keys to hope in assurance that you and I can find in the time of trouble. Before we get to the seven keys, let's go to Daniel 12. We want to talk about the time of trouble. Daniel 12, we're going to read verses 1 and 2. 
At that time, Michael, who's Michael? None other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Michael, Jesus, shall stand up. When Christ stands up, the investigative judgment, we've talked about this on previous lessons, the investigative judgment or the pre-advent judgment, that cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, it's over. Probation is closed. Everyone has made their final decision, either for or against Christ. There is no more mediator before the Father. The door of mercy is shut. The only thing left is to administer the positive or the negative verdict based on that investigative judgment. We see that in Revelation 22, verse 11. He who was unjust, let him be unjust still. He who was filthy, let him be filthy still. He who was righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who was holy, let him be holy still. In other words, the eternal fate, you could say, decision has been made. That's a better word. The decision has been made. Each person has fully decided either for or against the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. When I look at the time of trouble, this is Jill's interpretation, I see it as two sides of the same coin. In other words, the wicked on one side have God's protecting, restraining power removed and the world is plunged into complete rebellion without God. You know, Revelation 7 talks about the holding of the winds of strife that the angels do. And when that's released and the seven last plagues are poured out, the wicked are in a difficult time. But the other side of that coin is the righteous. What happens to the righteous during this time? What does it say? At that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, that would be written in the book of life. In Jeremiah 30, verses 5 and 7, it says, Thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice of trembling, of fear and not of peace. Verse 7, alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, what happened in the time of Jacob's trouble? We won't read it, but in Genesis 32, you see where Jacob wrestled all night with one, none other than the pre-incarnate Christ. He wrestled. The sense of his sins was overwhelming him. He knew that Esau was coming against him and his family as a direct result of what he had done in tricking his father all those years before. And he wrestled with God and said, I will not let you go until you bless me. One, it was a time of great mental anguish. And this time of trouble at the end of time will be a time of mental anguish for God's people as well. Is every sin repented? Is every sin confessed and blotted out? in the Lord's book in heaven. The lesson calls my day on Sunday, hope in the time of trouble. Now, if I'm being very frank with you, I have not always felt hopeful when I think about the time of trouble. And I don't know about any of you, growing up, I was terrified of the time of trouble. We talk about it at Seventh-day Adventists, there's coming this time of trouble. Now, I don't know how many, why people are afraid, but I would submit to you there's at least three reasons. One. We're afraid we're not holy enough to live without a mediator. We're told when Michael stands up, you better stand in the presence of God and you better be holy. And that terrifies us thinking, I got to try harder. I got to do more. I got to be better. We're going to talk about that. The second reason I think is maybe we're afraid we can't handle persecution. What am I going to do when the Sunday law comes? Am I going to be strong enough to stand? What if there's persecution? I think the third reason is maybe we're afraid we're not strong enough to watch the persecution of someone we love. Mm -hmm. I know Greg tells me this. I think maybe I'm more selfish than him. I'm a little more worried about myself. Mm -hmm. He says, I don't care what they do to me, but if they touch you, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. So there's that fear. What would you do if something mm -hmm. happens to those you love? Would you still stand for Jesus and stand for truth? So let's look at seven keys. We might not get to them all, but if we don't, you can get the notes. Seven keys to hope and assurance in the time of trouble. Key number one, God 
will be with us. We may feel alone, but we are never alone. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always, even to the end of the age or the end of the world. So we may feel alone. We may think I'm not strong enough to stand or I'm afraid of persecution or afraid of persecution of someone I love or there's no mediator. You are not alone. Jesus will always be with you. Amen. Number two, his word is sure. We may doubt his promises, but they will never fail. There has not one word failed of all his good promises. 1 Kings 8, verse 56. So when the devil comes against you with doubts and discouragements, you can claim those promises in the word. The word says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. That means Jesus has forgiven you and cleansed you from all unrighteousness. Number three, he lives in us by faith. I think this helps, especially with that fear. How am I going to live without that mediator? It's not you living. It's Christ living in you, the hope of glory. We cannot become perfect in ourselves, but you and I choose to surrender to the Lord Jesus. We allow him to live inside of us. Mm -hmm. John 14, verse 30, Jesus speaking. I will no longer talk much with you for the ruler of the world is coming and he has nothing mm -hmm. in me. Mm -hmm. That talks about Jesus' perfect sinlessness, but it shows what his followers can become if mm -hmm. Jesus resides in us. That's, right. That's no response to sin. And I'll just be honest with you, Jill's not there yet. Mm -hmm. No irritation or frustration, no desire for sinful pleasures, no lust, no ego, no pride no selfishness, only the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering. The lesson says this, in the time of trouble, God's people have a personal relationship with Jesus so deep that nothing can change it. That's only because Jesus dwells in us. And number four goes right along with number three, his spirit empowers us. We have strong tendencies to sin, absolutely. But his spirit can change those tendencies. So when we surrender and let him live inside, the Holy Spirit empowers you and I to live the life of Jesus. His righteousness covers us. That is his imparted and imputed righteousness. His, he cleanses us from sin forgives our sin, but he also changes us. And finally, God will protect us. God will provide for us and hold on. It will only be for a season. He is coming back. Amen. Thank you for that encouragement. I think you got all the way through the seven. <laughs> Send an email Sorry. anyway and get those notes to get what you missed. All right, my name is Daniel Perrin, and I have Monday's lesson, Hope in Jesus Soon Return. The great controversy, I am so glad, does not end with the great time of trouble. It ends with a great victory, and we have a great victor. For that, I am thankful. Monday's lesson takes you through chapter 40 of the great controversy called God's People Delivered, and I wanna walk through that chapter with you. It's not called God's People Assisted, or God's people's situation slightly improved, God's people delivered. Now, I've heard it said that we should not pray for Jesus to come soon. I've actually heard people say that. I've even heard people say, you need to tone down the preaching that Jesus is coming really soon. But you've got to listen to the testimony into the next to the last verse of the Bible, Revelation 22, 20. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. And then, amen. <laughs> Even so, come Lord Jesus, if, if you don't find that a call to preach and to pray for his soon coming, I, I don't know what else you're reading here. But I have to tell you that rescue is not going to come out of nowhere when you're in the grocery store. And this is what I thought when I was a kid, you know, we'd be having a potluck maybe and somebody would come running inside and say, hey, there's a really strange cloud out there. Oh, wow, here it is. It's, it's finally upon us. 
the rescue, the deliverance of God's people interrupts the time of trouble. It will interrupt a world that is in great crisis because during this time of trouble, there has been seven last plagues that we read about in Revelation that are causing devastation, physical, social, financial, political, and global. And Jesus appearing will rescue his people at the absolute end of the road emergency. And the time of trouble is going to be called that for a reason because God's people People are going to be the ones who are blamed for all the trouble that is going on in the world. And so their lives will be threatened and those threats will not be just talk. In fact, they will have set a day and an hour when, for their destruction because they dare to worship the Creator on His day, the Sabbath. And we can't have those dissenters, those people who are causing such problem. And it's that time then when Jesus will deliver his people in the moment of their greatest need, when they have nothing left on earth to cling to except the faith of Jesus. And you may have experienced that already, where, where God waits until the last minute, puts you through a trial when you've got nothing left to hold on to except for him. And why does he do that? to let you get rid of all those other things that you can't take with you to heaven. You can take nothing but the righteousness of Christ. Yes. It's not yours, but he offers it to you. Right. And so the faithful join together in companies of faith, but they, they have to cling to Christ and him alone for their deliverance. As Jesus' return becomes imminent, even the earth and the heavens begin to give illustration of what's happening. Every great salvation event has been heralded by the earth and the heavens. When Jesus was born, the, the nighttime skies illuminated. When Jesus died, the skies turned dark. The earth shook. When he was raised to life, the earth shook. And at Pentecost, flames of fire from the heavens came down onto those who were waiting and praying. And as he is approaching, the same God who controls the wind and the waves and holds them in place, he begins to release them for destruction. Darkness, representing the all-encompassing nature of sin, begins to cover the earth. No longer now is nature obeying what we call the rules of nature. They're not the rules of nature, they're the rules of God. And God sets them aside and uses nature to illustrate who's the one who controls the wind and the waves all along. The earth shakes, seas roar, winds howl, lightning flashes, and the unrighteous are shaking in terror. Even demons are shaking in terror, trembling at God's display of his power. But God has not abandoned his people, though all the earth seems to show that God has turned his face away. Light from God's throne, a rainbow of his covenant begins to encircle those who are gathered in prayer to God. Prison doors break open and those who have been cast into prison for their faith and for their testimony, they are released. At this point, every eye now is turned to what's happening. Nobody is going to sleep through this accidentally. Graves open of those who put Jesus to death 2,000 some odd years ago, fulfilling the promise Jesus made before the Sanhedrin that he is the Christ and you will see the Son of Man descending with power and great glory in the throne on God's throne. Those who died in the faith of the third angel's message are also raised to life to see what they in faith declared when few others believed it. The darkness surrounding the earth splits open and light from God's throne shines through. Those who were condemned by the world, they lift up their faces and they begin raising praises to God. As their praises rise, the clouds sweep back and the glory of God's dwelling in heaven shines through. All in the skies above, God's own law is, is displayed and revealed there for all to see. All the darkness swept away and the truth of God's law is made abundantly plain as if it hadn't been before, but it has. God's own voice now rolling like a thunder announces the day and the hour of deliverance and it is coming soon. As God's people listen, they look up with brightness reflecting in their faces and their enemies cannot approach them or draw near. 
Then a dark cloud appears in the east, small at first. The speed with which it approaches exceeds the speed of light, so no light can escape from it. Those who have trusted God's word know that this is the sign of the Son of Man, and they cannot look away as it's growing brighter and more glorious now. Jesus is returning, not as a man of sorrows, but as a victor and a righteous, holy king. The skies are now illuminated with a brightness that no human language could describe or express as promised. Every eye, every eye will see him, even the blind, I believe. And what will they see? Matthew 25, 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on his throne of glory. That's all the angels and each angel full of glory. This is glorious. Habakkuk 3, 3 and 4. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praises. His brightness was like the light. He had rays flashing from his hand and there was power and there his power was hidden. In the presence of Christ the King, God's people utter the question, who can stand? All of us have fallen. We have denied him. We have betrayed him. No one is righteous. Not one. All have turned away like sheep. And the angels now pause. Will, the, will there be an answer? And the answer is given. My grace is sufficient for thee. At, many, at, at this time, many scriptures reach their final fulfillment. Psalm 53 to 5, our God shall come and shall not keep silent. A fire shall devour before him and it shall be very tempestuous all around him. He shall call the heavens from above and call to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together to me. No one's laughing now. No one's mocking no one's out spending in the casinos. No one's trying to do their own thing, fighting. All hear the voice, that sweet voice that they have resisted. Though they've heard it, it's the voice of Jesus. And they feel the weight of Proverbs 1, 24 and 25. Because I have called and you refused. I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke. Amid the tumult of voices now, calling for rocks to, to, to fall on them and hide them from the face and the wrath of the Lamb, a remnant cries out, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him. And his voice now from above penetrates the ears of the dead. And we see in the ground graves breaking open, the clods of dirt falling away. And they, they rise to meet their Savior, not in the disfigurement of death, but perfect in health and beauty and strength. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 and 55, we hear it, we see it in reality. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? And in a moment... In the twinkling of an eye, we are changed. The corruptible then puts on incorruption. The mortal puts on immortality and God's people are delivered. Chapter 40, the great controversy, God's people delivered. Is it still reasonable to believe that Jesus is coming soon? I answer again with the word of God, proven and sure. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Now no, it's not reasonable to believe and preach that Jesus is coming soon. It is imperative to believe and preach that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. 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 Thank wow. you so wow. much, Daniel. Powerful. We're just getting started. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back, friends, to our study, The Triumph of God's Love, and we continue with more hope with Tuesday's lesson. 
Amen, amen. Praise God. Tuesday's lesson is entitled The Millennium on Earth. I'm Pastor James Rafferty, and we want to look at what takes place right after Jesus returns. Revelation chapter 19, the quarterly says, ends with a dramatic portrayal, as Daniel just shared with us, a dramatic portrayal of the return of Jesus Christ, the destruction of the wicked, but the story is not over. Revelation 20 introduces to us a period lasting 1,000 years known as the Millennium. Let's read it in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. What is Satan's fate at the return of Jesus is the question. The answer is found here, beginning with verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. Revelation 21 through 3. So the imagery here in Revelation 21 through 3, the lesson goes on to say is symbolic. Satan is not literally bound with a chain and locked into a pit for 1,000 years. He is confined to this desolate, depopulated earth bound by the circumstances which he himself has created. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, we read that Satan and his angels were reserved for punishment by, quote, chains of darkness, unquote. Mm -hmm. Satan will be confined to the earth by a chain of circumstances with no one to tempt because all the wicked have died, been slain at the brightness of Christ's coming, and all the righteous have been taken to heaven. So for 1,000 years, he will see the devastation, the destruction, the disaster which his rebellion had created. He's going to be in isolation on the earth with his angels. The Greek word translated bottomless pit is the same word from which we get our English word abyss. It is also the same word used in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament to describe the earth at creation. The earth was without form and void, Genesis 1-2, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the Septuagint, the word deep here in the Greek is the word abyssos or abyss. It describes a desolate earth. The bottomless pit is not some subterranean cave or some hot place in the middle of the center of the earth. It, the, the bottomless pit is not some yawning chasm out in the universe somewhere, the quarterly goes on to say. Satan's work of sin and destruction, along with tremendous chaos preceding the second coming, have brought the earth into this dark, disorganized mass like its condition before creation. Now, how do we know this? The Bible tells us. Let's read a few verses from the Old Testament. The first one is found in Jeremiah chapter 4, and let's begin with verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 23. Jeremiah is speaking here about this time of darkness, this time of desolation on the earth, and here's how he describes it. Verse 23, Jeremiah 4, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Same terminology we find in Genesis chapter 1. And the heavens had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man. There's the destruction of the wicked and the righteous in heaven. All the birds of the heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by His fierce anger. Let's look at another verse. This one is found in Jeremiah chapter 25. Well, actually, let's look first of all in Isaiah 24, verses 1, 3, and 5, and then we'll go to Jeremiah 25 and finish up. Isaiah chapter 24, beginning with verse 1, verses 1, 3, and 5. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty. He makes it waste. He turns it upside down. He scatters abroad the inhabitants thereof. The land shall be utterly emptied, utterly spoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws. They've changed the ordinances. They've broken the everlasting covenant. Right now we see this taking place on planet earth. We see all of the principles of God's laws being violated and we see men and women in rebellion against the creator of the universe. A final call is being made to the world, to the earth. A final call in Revelation chapter 14 entitled the three angels message and then another call is made in Revelation chapter 18. I want us to look at the call in Revelation chapter 18 just to get a perspective of what's happening in Revelation chapter 20. 
Revelation chapter 18, beginning with verse 1. This is the final call, what we call the fourth angel's message. And after these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Now, don't misunderstand. Revelation chapter 18 is taking place after Revelation 15 and 16, as it's written here, but it's not taking place after Revelation 15 and 16 in the actual historical prophetic order. Revelation 15 and 16 is the outpouring of God's wrath, the seven last plagues. Revelation 18 is an explanation of what God did in preparation for the outpouring of his wrath. Before he pours out his wrath, he actually lightens the earth with his glory. Let's keep reading here. Verse two, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now I like the way Revelation chapter 18 reads, in the NASB, it says that the, this world, excuse me, Babylon has become the prison house of devils. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's taking place in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 is explaining that this world has now become the prison house of devils. That this world has been turned into a, a demonic uh, place that is only habitable for devils. And God is saying in Revelation chapter 18, I'm sending Satan to prison. How do you like that? I'm sending Satan to prison. He's going for life. He's never going to be let out except for this little season when he gets a trial. He's never going to be let out of this prison. And therefore, this earth in its desolate state is going to become his prison house. And I'm calling you, my people, out. I want you to separate from everything demonic, everything satanic, everything that is labeled with Satan and his deceptions. I want, to, I want you to pull out of all of that and I want you to surrender your hearts and your lives to me and worship me, the Father, the, the Lord God and creator of heaven and earth. So this is the last call before this system in, uh, collapses and Satan himself is sent to prison. Revelation chapter uh, 20 is describing Satan himself being sent to prison. One more verse in Jeremiah chapter 25 verse 33. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be as dung upon the ground. Now you might ask the question, well, why wouldn't they be buried and why wouldn't they be gathered? And the reason why this verse is so significant is because it reminds us of the reason why they won't be buried and they won't be gathered because there's not going to be anyone to do that. All of the wicked are going to be destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming. All of the righteous are going to be taken to heaven. There's not going to be anyone else left on planet earth but the devil and his angels. And they are in this chain of circumstances because all of their existence in their fallen state has been occupied in tempting people and leading people into sin and deceiving people. They're going to find themselves without anything to do for 1,000 years. In a sense, they're in solitary confinement on the island of, of earth. And then after the thousand years, they're going to receive the sentence for all of their rebellion against God, along with the rest of the wicked who are resurrected for a short time. And we'll be touching on that here in a little bit. So Revelation 18, 2 kind of helps us to understand what's taking place in Revelation chapter 20. The cage, the prison house of evil, the prison house of the devil and his angels, and God is calling us to come out of that prison house right now. This may be the last call you hear in your life, in your situation, the Holy Spirit convicting you to separate, to part from those things that are dark and evil. God is calling you to come out of the crash of Babylon in these last days. Going back to the quarterly, the prophets here emphasize the catastrophic destruction at the second coming of Christ, and that no person is left alive on earth. And that during this thousand year period, Satan and his evil angels will be left to contemplate the havoc caused by their rebellion. The entire universe recognizes anew that the wages of sin is death. God deals with the sin problem so that it will never again arise. Nehemiah, uh, Nahum chapter one and verse nine. Affliction will never rise its ugly head, raise its ugly head again. Now there are three prime ways that God does this. First, he reveals his limitless love, his passionate desire, his relentless efforts to save all of humanity. That's taking place right now. Second, 
He reveals his justice, his fairness, and his righteousness. That is about to take place in the context of the seven last plagues and moving into the execution of the judgment. And then third, he allows the universe to see the ultimate results of sin and rebellion. Friends, this is our time to wake up. This is our time to come out of that darkness and join with God in this eternal plan of salvation. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Powerful lesson indeed. My name is Ryan Day. I have Wednesday's lesson entitled Judgment in the Millennium. And we're going to be looking at uh, the judgment that actually takes place during the thousand years. And also there's a judgment that takes place at the end of the thousand years. And we're going to address that as well. And I'm going to try my best not to dip too much over into Pastor Loma King's lesson because I know he's going to tie it all together for us. Uh, we're going to jump right into Revelation chapter 20 and read verses 4 through 6 because as Pastor James Rafferty brought out very clearly, uh, the dead have been slain. Uh, their bodies and, and dead carcasses are scattered all over the earth. That's what Matthew 24 uh, says very clearly uh, that remember Jesus said where the carcass is there will the eagles be gathered together. The slain of the Lord are many. The devil and his minions are here upon the earth uh, just in total darkness. No one to bother, no one to tempt, but the righteous as, as, as he said are brought to heaven with the Lord. And so what will we be doing in heaven for 1000 years with the Lord? Well, it's going to be a great time indeed, but it's also going to be a time of question. It's going to be a time of inquiry and God is going to make all things clear to us during that 1000 years. Let's read about this in Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 through 6. John is in vision and he says, And I saw thrones and they sat on them, speaking of the righteous, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their, uh, for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection." Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now let's go back and let's uh, just talk about what it means when it says judgment was committed to them. Now let's make it very, very clear here. Remember Jesus says there in Revelation chapter 22 that uh, behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give everyone according as his work shall be. So in this case, Jesus is, uh, is coming back with judgment, with the reward upon those, uh, upon everyone, those who have been decided to go to heaven, which of course represented by the sheep or the wheat as brought about in the parable or the tares, of course, the wicked or the goats also uh, symbolized by the wicked there are obviously slain at the presence of the Lord. So God knows ultimately the eternal fate of everyone by the time he arrives. In other words, the decision is already made by the ultimate judge, Jesus Christ. But when it says judgment is committed to them, uh, we participate in judgment in the sense that we will have questions. We will wonder, hey, Jesus, what about so-and-so? Where are they or why? Why did you make this decision? We're going to be able to review the books because the Bible makes it very clear that there are multiple books uh, of, of, uh, of uh, record that we will be able to review. And it, actually, we will be able to participate in the understanding of the rightful judgment that God is going to bring upon the unrighteous and, of course, even the fallen angels at the end of the 1,000 years. Now, where do we get this idea from? First, first Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. Paul makes this very, very clear. He says, do you not know, speaking, he's writing to the church, he's writing to the saints in the church, but he says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Mm -hmm. now, now, judge the world in what way? Obviously, we will be able to participate, to concur with what God's judgment is and to be able to see that his judgment is righteous upon the fate of those, whether, again, accounted for heaven for a thousand years or for all eternity or of those who are the wicked. But he goes on to say, and if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge even the smallest matters? And then verse three, do you not know that we shall judge angels? What kind of angels? 
the righteous angels need no judgment, right? Because they're righteous. They chose to stay. They made their decision in eternity's past when, when the heavens split during that time when one third of the angels went with Lucifer and they were cast out. Those that were not cast out, they made their decision to serve their master, Jesus Christ. And so in this case, it says, do you not know that the saints shall judge or the world, the, the, do you not know that we shall judge angels? It's speaking of fallen angels. We're talking about Lucifer and all of the fallen angels. And of course, it goes on to say how much more things that pertain to this life. You see, the saints will be given the ability to look at the record books, as I said earlier, and to review and concur God's just judgment. No one will be in heaven and will say, oh, but Jesus, I think you made a mistake here. Or I, 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 don't, I don't think that this person should have been here, Lord. I think you probably need to go ahead and send them back down there with all that. No one's going to be questioning God's judgment. We may have questions. We may wonder, but all things will be made clear. That's why I love that song. Uh, I love that old song and I, I recorded it on my, on my CD. Uh, we'll understand it better by and by. That old hymn. Uh, we'll understand it better by and by because as the time goes on, God's going to make it more and more clear to us uh, that uh, of his perfect just judgment. The saints will also concur on the judgment set against fallen angels as I said earlier. But what happens at the end of millennium? There's another aspect of judgment that comes as the millennium comes to a close. We see there in the opening verses of Revelation 21 verses two and three, it says, and I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, come down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. So the new Jerusalem at the end of the thousand years comes down and it sets up on this earth over where the Mount of Olives were over in the Holy Land area. And then, and you can imagine, I can just imagine Lucifer, he's been, him and the and the fallen angels have been in total darkness for a thousand years. They didn't even have a night light. But then at the end of the thousand years, they see the brightest light that they've ever seen in a long, long time come down from heaven. And of course, Christ is that light because the Bible says the light of the city, there's no need for a moon or sun or stars or any natural light because Christ is the light of that city. He sees the city. He sees the light of Christ. He knows that the saints are there. He sees the city come down. And now we're told in Revelation 20 verses seven to nine, that uh, he now, there's this special resurrection. Remember it said the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Well, now there's this special resurrection of the wicked. They're all going to be resurrected together. Even those that were in the graves that did not come forward at the second coming of Jesus, they're all going to come out of the graves from Cain, from the very beginning of time, all the way down. All of the wicked are going to come out of the graves for this special judgment scene that's going to happen. And notice what it says in Revelation 20, verse to seven to nine. It says, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, meaning his circumstances have changed. He now sees all of those people that uh, had made their decision to serve him and he's going to try to deceive them one last time. It says, and he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, representative of the, uh, the enemies of God, all of the enemies of God, to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. That's the righteous on the inside of the city. And then verse nine, they went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city because they think that Satan has deceived them into believing and thinking that they can take the city. There's more of us than there are of them. Let's just surround the city. Let's attack the city and we'll take the city and claim it for ourselves because he is delirious into believing that in one last ditch effort, he's going to try to fight to the end because he believes he can set up his own kingdom and receive worship. And of of course, there's something that happens here. Mm -hmm. There's a break here. Jump down to verse 11 to 13, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 to 13. John says, then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great standing before God and the books were opened. There's those, those books I mentioned earlier. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The seas gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged each one according to his work. This is what we call the great white throne judgment. All, every person that has ever lived on this earth from the beginning of time, both righteous and wicked, the righteous on the inside of the 
city and the wicked on the outside of the city, only separated by a transparent wall that surrounds this beautiful city of God. Everyone is there and Jesus high and lifted up on his throne. He declares judgment on the wicked for the last time, including the devil. And it says there in Revelation 20 and verse uh, nine, let's go back to verse nine, the second part of that verse. It says, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. But I love Revelation 21 verses 4 and 5. This is the hope that we have that when God destroys and he brings about the final judgment upon the wicked and deals with sin. It says, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no That's more right. sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. And of course it says, then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. Amen. Wow. Thank you all for laying such a, an effective foundation. And I end with the phrase two eternities. I begin with the book Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Friends, 6,000 years delayed, yet not denied. Each one of us is facing two eternities, eternal life or eternal death. And there is no third category. And the question is, what would you do in light of the inevitable? Would you prepare for it? Would you ignore it? Would it seem relevant and important to you? Would it become your singular most important focus? For the fact is the world is being conveyed to a time of incomprehensible catastrophe, something hardly imagined in the minds of movie makers. No one could even replicate or duplicate this in the most amazing minds of producers and movie makers. So come with me to the most intense period of Earth's history. This is the moment of unquestionable loyalty. Polarization is complete. Polarity is absolute. There is no middle ground. There are no neutral places. The lines of distinction are drawn and everyone identifies with one group or the other. You see, for 6,000 years, we have been confronted by an indiscriminate contagion. Calamity and disease are Satan's tools preparing the world for its final end. Mm. There is today an irreversible, fearful anxiety hovering over humanity. Unquenchable disasters are consuming life's accomplishments in minutes, medically, socially, economically, financially, and religiously, citizens of the world are in a solemn awe about the future of planet Earth. Ellen White says in Testimonies for the Church, volume 9, page 43, she says, We are on the verge of the time of trouble, and perplexities that are scarcely dreamed of are before us. And there are two facts about what's coming. One, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. When this day arrives, the Bible says unequivocally, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. What would you do if you knew that you had an undeniable, inescapable day to stand before the judge? Mm. What kind of life would you live? How would you change your day-to-day -day thinking, your day-to-day -day entertainment? How would your mind be remolded and reshapen knowing that you're gonna stand before a judge who sees not only what you're saying, but sees you internally, your mind, your workings, your past, your present. Fact number two, Romans 14, verse 10 and 11, everyone will be in one group or the other. Paul says, but why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, he says, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. I like the way that pa Pastor Mark Finley put it. He said, to resolve the sin problem so evil, it will never rise again. Everyone must be convinced that God has been fair and just in all his ways. Ultimately, every knee shall bow and acknowledge God's justice in the great controversy. And listen to this, even Satan and his evil angels 
and that there will never again be any justification for rebellion against God. What am I saying? Every one of us will stand on one side of the verdict or the other, and every decision that God would make in that awful time will be flawless. Revelation 15 verse 3 tells us it this way. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. When the verdict by the all-knowing one, the omniscient one, the omnipresent one is handed down, there will be no appeals made, no court to overturn, overturn God's final verdict. In the Great Controversy, page 66 and 668, we read these words, The whole world stands arrayed at the bar of God on the charge of high treason against the government of heaven. Where do you want to stand? They have none to plead their cause. They are without excuse, and the sentence of eternal death is pronounced against them but friends, I have good news. That time hasn't yet come. You have the decision today to make a choice on which side will you stand. Are we speaking of something that's going to happen, might happen, that's possibly inevitable? No, it is as uncertain. It is as certain as me speaking now. It will come. As Habakkuk says, though it tarries, wait for it, it will come. Revelation 20 and verse 9 tells us what happens in this awful time. Who will stand before this judgment bar? And the Bible says, speaking about the second resurrection, those who chose not to accept Jesus as their Lord, the Bible says, they went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. You see, not sinners, but saints. Let's change our vernacular. I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I'm a saint. My sin has been covered by the blood of the lamb. I'm a saint under construction. Can we all say amen? Amen. We were sinners when, when we were yet in sin, Christ died for us. He did not only change our standing before God, he changed the label by which we are identified. We are the saints of God. Paul never said, greet the sinners in Rome. He said, greet the saints in Rome. Mm. The Bible says, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Devoured who? Those who chose not to put God in their insurance policy. Those who chose not to buy fire insurance and life insurance. For you see, friend, at the end of this journey, there are only two seats, smoking and non-smoking. I plan on being in the non-smoking one. What about you? The earth will be purified of sin. Everything that's connected with sin will be erased. And when we look around for the wicked, they won't be seen. No eternal lake of people burning and withering in, in the fires of, of torment. That's not the God we serve. Psalm 37, verse 10 and 20 says, For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish into smoke. They shall vanish away. Well, what's happening here? Number one, all the conditions of sin will be eradicated. Molly would say, praise the Lord. Shelley would say, hallelujah. I say, thank you, Jesus. Revelation 21, verse 1 and 4. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. And I, John, saw, I take that personal, I, John, saw the holy city. New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Can you see her coming down? Can you see this glorious gem of a city God prepared? No flaws, a solid foundation. And the Bible says, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their gods. And what else will the Lord do? He's going to take out his handkerchief and said, No more tears. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. Why? For the former things have passed away. Amen. The earth will be purified, Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Also the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. And one of my favorite quotes I add here, Great Controversy, page 678 and paragraph 3. The controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. 
the entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats throughout the vast creation. Do you want to hear that pulse on that glorious day? Mm. Do you want to be the one to see a new heaven and a new earth coming into view? Do you want to be the one sitting at the feet of Jesus, thanking him for a deliverance, mm -hmm. not an alteration, as James says, but a deliverance, mm -hmm. not an alteration, as Daniel says, but a deliverance mm -hmm. from him who created all flow life and light and, and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space from the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. What are the two eternities? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. I've got some good news, friends, and it's on the way. It's not too far away. You see, friends, one day, Sin will be eradicated, death will be exterminated, pain will be eliminated, and sorrow will be terminated. War will be assassinated, hate will be obliterated, sinners will be extricated, life will be celebrated, Satan will be annihilated, and Jesus will be vindicated. Mm. But the question is, you. where will you stand? Only one side or the other? the wages of sin or the gift of God. Today, you had that opportunity. Check the box. Wow. Life eternal. The day is on its way. Amen. Amen. God. Thank you so much. What an amazing lesson. The triumph of God's love. Right. I want to give each mm. one of you a moment to share a mm. final thought. You are of infinite value to God. There will never be another you. God loves you. And if you are listening right now, the invitation is open to you. Amen. Amen. Satan is bound for prison and we are bound with him. He's led us into sin and the wages of sin is death and we deserve to be to, pri to go to prison with him. But we have a last call, the Revelation 18 angel that lightens the earth with the glory of God that brings us the everlasting gospel. Pardon can be written against our names. Let it be written against yours. Mm. Amen. Especially my lesson in Pastor Loma King's lesson, reading from Revelation 21 and also you can add to that 22. You know, all I could think of is the song, No More Night. I love That's that right. song. No more night, no more pain. There will be no more tears, never crying again. And praises to the great I am. We will live in the light of the risen Lamb. Amen. Hallelujah. What a day that's going to be when we can all sing that song together. You see, friends, the good news is very simple. Nahum 1, 9, affliction, sin, pain, suffering, death, sorrow, crying, disease will not rise up a second time. Are you getting ready? It's on the way. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor John and Ryan and Pastor James and Daniel. Thank you for your study of the word. It's been such a privilege to journey through the great controversy with That's each right. one of you and with you at home as well. I want to leave you with this scripture in Ezekiel 18. Turn, repent from your transgressions for why should you die? The invitation is open to you right now. Reach out and say, yes, Jesus, I want to follow you and I want your blood to cover me. Join us next quarter for the Book of Mark.